Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another Bible with Bordeaux study of James segment. Study of James is what we're going to be continuing with today. Thank you so much for checking this out. I'm Jason Bordeaux, your humble host, and we're going to be diving into some really good stuff today. Uh, we're going to be talking about sin, where it comes from, why we sin, sinful nature, all that good stuff. And we're going to be covering James chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. 13 through 18. And if you haven't been, you know, watching or caught up, I have the other previous 12. Actually, I did verse 13 in the last one too, but I want to kind of do a jumping point from 13 into 14. So I'm going to still read that, gently cover it, gently, slightly, a little bit, and then we're going to dive into the new stuff. So I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and dive into it. We're going to go ahead and read this together. So here's what it says, James 1, and this is going to be reading from the ESV. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation of shadow due to change, of his own will he can be brought forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of his first fruits of his creatures. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I don't know how far we're going to get uh you know, I'm prepped up to, but obviously I want to make sure I'm staying within that 20-minute time constraint that I'm setting on myself, just because I know it's easier to digest chunks in about 10, 15, 20 minutes. So let's go ahead and, and talk about this. Now, you know, James lets us know in the previous verse in 13, he says that God himself is not tempted to sin, and he does not tempt us to sin. So one of the issues that we need to address is what about Jesus? What about Jesus? Uh, he was tempted by Satan, right? And if his temptation, if it says here that we're tempted by our sinful desires, you know, does that mean Jesus was tempted by sinful desires? So let's dive into it. Now, James addresses our sinful nature without addressing any kind of enemy. So this is the interesting thing. He didn't say that Satan causes our death, our sin, temptation. He doesn't mention an enemy at all. Now, we know that Satan does come to tempt us often, but in this passage, James talks about our temptation coming from our own desires. So it's a self-reflection, not a shifting the blame to others. I think we have a tendency to blame everything on Satan, and I think sometimes it's careless because it takes away from the responsibility we have to walk holy lives. And I think we have to quit shifting the blame on Satan and take responsibility for ourselves and our actions. Now, I think we have to understand that there are two different sources of temptation, though. Now, Satan, or an enemy of some sort, that is legit. In Scripture, you do see Satan being a source of temptation in our own sinful nature. Now, like I said earlier, Jesus was tempted, but he was tempted by Satan, not by a sinful nature. Because Jesus didn't have a sinful nature. Even Adam and Eve, they were tempted by Satan because they actually didn't have a sinful nature like we do. Because they were created in the image of God. God, holy, completely holy, completely good, completely perfect. Adam was an offspring of God the Father. And it wasn't until Adam sinned in the garden that it became a sinful nature issue for the rest of us. Now, because of that, we actually do have a sinful nature. Us, everybody else that came after Adam and Eve have sinful natures. Now, you know, the verse kind of compares, uh, talks about our desire of sin. It's kind of like a fish being drawn out of a hiding place. Now, once a fish leaves its safe space, the predator will come and just swallow it up and eat it up. And in this case, I'd say we're the fish and the predator because we kill ourselves with sin. In verse 15, it talks, you know, as if like there's a domino effect. And so it starts with desire, and then it goes to action, and then finally death. 
Now, you know, the death, it could be spiritual or physical. Now, spiritual death, and this is what happened in the garden whenever Adam and Eve sinned. That was actually, that death was a separation from God. So sin separates mankind from God. And then you have physical death, which is when our bodies actually die. And so sin has two different ways of uh, inflicting death upon us. Now, I also want to say, let's not confuse tempt with test. So in verse 13, it says God doesn't tempt anyone. He does test us, though, and we know he tests us because he tested Abraham. He tested his faith. So, But he, he doesn't tempt us to sin, though, and that's what we need to always remember. And sometimes temptation can actually test our resolve. So a temptation can be a testing for us, but the temptation itself never comes from God. Now, where does our sinful nature come from? That's the big question. I think that's the... The, the driving force of this particular scripture. And we're going to talk about it a little more in James as well, but definitely right here. I wanted to kind of dive into Romans 5.12. And in Romans 5.12, Paul says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. So it's just talking about how man was sinful before there was actually a law to be given. So this is all of mankind, not just Israel. But sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, and even over those who, those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So this sin is not just a direct uh, breaking of the law. It's, it's breaking anything that God's told us to do. So I look at anything that we're told by scripture that God says, you know, these things you do and don't do that is sin that that's disobeying God. And it's a form of rebellion, which is ultimately what Adam, Adam did. He rebelled because he knew what he was supposed to do and he didn't do it. Or he actually did what he wasn't supposed to do. So that's kind of how death occurs. And he talks about the, the process of death, uh, a curse from our desires to sin. And then once we have those desires to sin, we act on it. And it's the action that brings upon death. And so we need to pray that God will give us godly desires so that temptation to sin will fade away. So, you know, if you think about in the Old Testament where it says, you know, God gives us the um, desires of our heart. I've heard some people say that that text actually means he puts a new desire on our heart. Like he creates a desire in us to want to please him, which I think is good. And I like that. I'm not going to tell you right now whether that text means that. I hadn't studied that in depth, but I, I like that idea. I think in general, it's good for us to ask God, Lord, give me new desires. Give me godly desires so I can serve you better and serve my fellow man better and want the things of God, not the things of the flesh because the things of the flesh bring death. So, and the issue is, is to be honest, some temptations may never fade away. Some may always be there. You, know, you look at Paul, he had that struggle of the thorn in the flesh, which could have possibly been some sort of temptation to sin. Uh, many people believe it was a physical ailment, but Paul's thorn, you know, it could have been a reference to a temptation to sin. And we're not entirely sure, but in any case, in any case, we should always avoid acting on sinful desires. And next question, well, if we have these sinful desires, if we're sinful in nature, and I want to talk about that just, just a brief moment here. I actually didn't plan on it, but it just came to me. So when you're thinking about you know, nature, sinful nature, the, the fleshly nature, carnal nature, nature flows from, from one thing to something like it. And so if you're reading in Genesis... You're reading through the account of creation. You see, you know, God made plants and it reproduced after its own kind. Everything reproduced after its own kind. And so whenever God created Adam and Eve in his image, he created them after his own kind, which was perfect. Well, once sin came into the picture, once Adam rebelled, then everybody that followed him followed in his kind. 
So now he was a sinful creature, so all of us are sinful. And the sinful is passed down, that sinful nature is passed down from generation to generation all the way to us today. And so really, it's Adam's fault. <laughs> like, if there's one person to blame for everything, the person who had complete free will, like complete, he didn't have a sinful nature pulling him towards sin. It was just straight up rebellion, which I think is terrible. You know, it's terrible. So, uh, sin causes death, you know, oh no, sorry, I'm gonna go back. So many of our struggles can be fixed through the renewing of our minds, the renewing of our minds. And, uh, and one of the first things that we're told in regards to this, uh, Romans 12 two, it says, don't be conformed to the way of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so I think that renewing of the mind is kind of our goal. That's that's what we should want to do. And in order to do that, you know, one way is to cast out every thought. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, it says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So every time we get an evil thought, something bad, no matter what it is, we should take that cast it out and think about the good things of God. Think about his truth. And I think, especially in today's world, in today's time, in the situation we find ourselves in, you know, at least in America as a nation, we have so many thoughts going through our minds all the time, evil thoughts. And yes, they are evil. They are evil thoughts. Uh, A lot of people have negative connotations about people. They want people to die. They want you know, buildings and governments and all these things to burn. And then you have other people on the other side who are uh, making fun of, criticizing, and all these things of the people. So it's like this war back and forth of evil thoughts. And I think we need to, as Christians, we need to put aside any of those evil thoughts, whether we feel like they're justified or not, and focus on the things of God. This is our struggle. This is our battle as Christians. So in Philippians 4, 8, you know, Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So at the if there's nothing else you could think of, think about God and his goodness and praise him for that. What you have learned and received and have seen in me, practice these things and God of peace will be with you. The God of peace, God brings peace, sin brings death. It's two opposing things where we're thinking about the things of God and we're putting aside the struggles and the things of man. Our temptation to sin goes down a lot and our desire to do good things increases by a ton, by a ton. Now, as I started to say earlier, one last thing I wanted to hit on. Let me see where my time is right now. Uh, 13. Okay. Uh, let me dive in this and I'll see if we're going to go forward. So our sin also, it, it causes death to relationships as well. So one of the reasons we're given the law uh, or, or the Israels, Israelites were given the law was to live in harmony with one another. And when you look at the Old Testament law, you're thinking about, you know, you got civil law. So if this person does this, you respond this way, the elders respond this way, or the, the priest respond this way, things like that. You know, they're given so many instructions on how to, to, to deal with each other as a nation. Because Israel was taken out of Egypt. They were in captivity and they were in slavery for generations and they didn't know how to function as their own independent nation. And so God gave them the law. He said, hey, these are the things, because every nation has laws, like all of them do. And if they don't, then it's not really a nation. It's just anarchy. And so for Christians, we are, in a sense, a type of nation. We're a group of individuals under the theocracy of God, under the rule of God, under the law of God, under the law of grace. Yes, the law of grace. But we're under his guidance, his rulership, his leading, and anything that he says goes above any other form of government. And so they're given the law to live in harmony with one another. So 
when we're thinking about like the Old Testament law, things like that, where, you know, when they didn't follow the law, they were in sin, right? And that's what I want to get back to is, is the sin aspect here. They're obeying the law so they don't sin. But the law had reasons, like there were laws that had practical reasons for it being there. And one of those is so the nation could function well together as a body of, of believers. And for us, it's the same thing. Whenever we sin, we're either hurting ourselves or we're hurting those around us. Like the fleshly desire to talk bad about people is bad. It's bad for relationships. You know, when you don't love your wife, husbands, that's bad. You know, when you don't respect your husband, that causes tensions and, and problems in the home. It's bad. When fathers, when you're really negative to your children, that's bad. Like children, when you don't obey your parents, it's bad. So all these things that God told us to do, they're there so we can live in harmony with one another. And when we don't, sin brings death to those relationships. And in a spiritual cause, it, it makes people separate. So I think it's important to understand that as well. And so, you know, we look at the Word of God to make sure that we're treating one another in love and so that we don't destroy our relationships with one another. And so when you look at 1 Corinthians 13, right, that's the big love chapter of the Bible. It's read at a lot of weddings. It's given through a lot of marriage counseling and premarital counseling, things like that. We need to look at those things and say, or am I handling my relationships with this form of love, with this form of godly love? And if we're not, I'd say in a way that's that's a sin. It's, it's something wrong, and it brings death to that. So sin brings death. It brings death, whether it's physical death or whether it's spiritual death, which is separation. And that's either separation from God or separation from one another. So that's one thing I want to focus on, and that desire, we need to, to renew the thinking that we have in our hearts or in our minds, in our hearts. And so one, I got to say one thing, one thing real quick before I end this out. So I was trying to do some research and, you know, that the repentance, the renewing the mind, I was thinking of a proverb that I always heard, Proverbs 23, 7, I think it is. And I was reading it because, you know, I've always heard as a man thinks in his heart, so was he. And as I was reading the, the scripture, it's not that clean cut and dry, Right. Like this is this is a little bit of a tangent, but for anybody who just wants to to check this out real quick, let me look it up real quick. Um, it's it's very interesting, very interesting. Let me bring up my program so y'all can read it along with me. So it says, yeah, right here at seven. Well, I'm gonna start at six. Do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. Do not desire his delicacies, for he is like one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. He will, you will vomit up the morsels that you have eaten and waste your pleasant words. The whole point of that scripture right there, it has nothing to do with saying, whatever I think I am, I am. It's not what that means. This scripture is saying that people will falsely uh, promise you things or whatever, but it's not in their heart. There's other, there's other um, translations that says that he, he offers you something to eat and you think it's out of the goodness of his heart, but it's not. Like, and some say, you know, he, he offers you food like you're like like he's going to pay for it, and he has no intention of paying for it. So, uh, he is what is what is in his heart. So in that moment, that man is is he's being wicked, is being deceitful, and I was just thinking, man, this passage is take out take out of context a lot. Sorry, that was kind of a tangent or whatever, but I just wanted to share that with you in case you were thinking about that scripture when you were listening to this. Read scripture in context. But uh, I do want to thank you for checking this out. If you're struggling with any sinful thoughts, try to try to renew them. Focus on the things of God. Focus on the things of uh, read scripture. You know, there's a lot of great verses out there and you can look them up. You know, motivational verses or verses about Jesus. Just read the Gospels. You know, read Philippians. Philippians is a great book to read. It's very short. Ephesians. Just think us, think us, focus and think on the things of God. And hopefully that'll change your mindset so you don't have a, a temptation to do wrong things. And so I'll be back with another video, hopefully not too long. I'm also doing the weekly motivational videos or the weekly devotionals. 
motivation, devotion, whatever it is. I'm dropping those every Monday. That's two to five or two to three minutes, not too long. And also, if you have any questions that you would like to ask me, either clarification on this, what we talked about today, or anything else, I would love to answer that for you on this channel. I will look up the information, uh, dive into scriptures, try to find a good biblical answer, and get that back to you via video here on YouTube. So again, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you have a blessed, blessed week, and God bless.